The ideal board of education would be solution oriented, willing to be open to new ideas and techniques, and be a partner in problem solving. Ms. Hale, your second question was number 15. Number 15, okay. <clears throat> How would you go about determining the current needs and concerns of the district's teachers and non-certified staff? I've had the opportunity of working with the employee advisory this past year. It has been a great um, experience for me. I feel like it's very successful. Um, this last group, they have had such wonderful questions, and they are truly tasked. They task themselves with making sure that they listen to their peers. They bring the questions to the employee advisory, and then they take answers back, and that has been successful. That would be something I would want to continue um, as well. I, something kind of new that I, I think I would, I've thought about a lot, I'd like to have office hours some open office hours to where if someone had a concern, okay, the door's open, come on in. So that's something. Um, surveys, regular site visits, want to be visible, want to be in their schools, want to be on campuses, um, I want to be in the community. So those are also things that I would do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, my question goes right in with what you just got through talking about. Number okay. 16, right. uh, how would you define the term open door policy and would you have one? Absolutely. I've always had one. Um, as a teacher, other teachers could come and ask questions, anybody, students. As a principal, my door was always open. If you come up here, my door is open. Um, I will take time. People are important. People, their concerns and their needs are important. And that is what an open door policy is. It gives someone a place to come, talk to you in a safe and um, private environment. And that is what I would have. And like I said, I would like to have office hours. I think that would also help. Uh, just, you know, it wouldn't be during the day because the majority of your staff couldn't come. But I would like to have some days that, hey, I'm here. It's sacred time, nothing scheduled. You're welcome to come. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Mr. Brock, you remember the question? 25, yes. <laughs> Prepare. State government and special interest groups in recent years have demanded a greater voice than how local school districts function. As our director of school, how would you respond to those demands? Especially if they were unreasonable. Or well, respectful conversations, once again, being willing to listen, having that open door, um, but always falling back on policy and procedure, state law, federal law, and then going from there. I mean, I will be willing to listen to anyone. Try to work with them. But obviously, my goal, I have to follow state law policy. <coughs> policy county procedures. Follow. Yes, sir. I'll give an example. <clears throat> uh, librarians, in particular, in recent weeks and months, have been, in my opinion, totally and unfairly hammered for the books in their library. Books that they did not maybe personally select, but were even on state reading lists. Yet we have legislators saying awful, terrible things about these educators. How can we respond to that? Once again, we have to go back to what state law says and the rules for the library. So we would listen, and if they bring a book and they, we can, we can do a book study, that's policy, 
and we would decide if we take it out of our library or not. Uh, but I would lean towards whatever the law says. And I would make sure my libraries are supported and they feel it's for it, but they know that I have to follow along. Okay, Mr. King, uh, no, 19, yes, sir. How do you feel about grade retention? That is the repeating of grades or classes, how it impacts student success. Well, we are in uncharted water when it comes because of the pandemic. Um, students have lost skills due to the pandemic and not being in school. We've lost time. Um, but studies show retention is not probably the best path. However, it is not black or white. There's a lot of gray. And I think at that point, we look at each individual student and we do what's best for that student. There are a lot of factors that go into that. We do have a retention plan that we make with parents and staff, uh, teachers here in the county. And then there's a rubric that we use to decide where they fall. Um, should they be held back or should they go on? Um, but if they are retained, if for some chance we decide that that is best. We have got to change what we did the year before if it didn't work. So we would have to come up with a different plan and make sure that we hone in to that student and do something different that will help them be successful and catch up. I do think with Tennessee Alcor tutors in place and more interventionists that that will help students catch up. Okay, Ms. Hamby. Number 10. Uh, number 10. Yes, ma'am. How can we better accommodate district parents suffering from economic disadvantage and or disabilities? Once again, we're going to be open to them, just like we would staff. We're going to partner with them. However, I think as a district, we need to probably take a hard look at our personnel that we have that uh, meet those needs of those students. We're a, we're a county of 7,000 students. You know, we may need more personnel to work with partnering, partnering um, local groups and state organizations to help us help those parents. Thank you. So. Okay. Ms. Boston, uh, number 27. 27. Well, you take your time. You, you take your notes. I have to take my notes. Um, number 27, what do you believe to be the role of the Board of Education in district leadership as compared to that of the Director of Schools? The Board of Education is the, is the, butter, the uh, governing body, body of the district. Okay? Policy is what the Board of Education does. The, the director of schools takes care of daily operations, personnel, and uh, adheres to policies and procedures and makes sure that, the, that our personnel are doing, adhering to those as well, sorry. Um, I do feel, though, that the director of schools and the Board of Education are a team, as I said before, and I do feel that we should work together. So even though your role is the governing body that works with policy making. Still think you have a voice. Can I follow up? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You say we are the governing body and we deal with policy. Yes. Um, what about finances? With our committees, you deal with budgeting as well. You have a voice in all of those. Absolutely, that goes with policy. And I'm sorry, I guess I should have said that, but Yes, you have say in it, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I would definitely want you to keep me in check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Safty, your third question. This is number 21. I, I, I am so very proud of our school system and, its, um, and our teachers with... Um, teaching our K through three, uh, but apparently 
according to state records, our third graders, our third graders, um, only th about 30 percent of our third graders are uh, are competent at the third grade level in reading. So my question to you is, um, what's gone, what's gone wrong, and what do we have to do to improve that reading score in K th at the third grade level? As to what's gone wrong, part of it is we, the pandemic and losing skills. Um, I also feel that, especially for reading, our materials were very outdated. We come into a pandemic, we have a new reading curriculum, CKLA. Um, I feel very confident, especially with the training and the partnership with TNTP that our teachers have undergone the past two years. I feel that you will see some changes in the reading scores. We are foundational first, and our teachers are truly, truly doing this with fidelity, and you can see it working in the classrooms. So I feel that that partnership with TNTP and our new curriculum have, will show some changes. Thank you. You're welcome. I feel strongly about that. <laughs> okay, Ms. Shirley, your third question is number 12. Seriously, should our school district take bullying, and what can we do better? Well, I feel that we take it seriously now, and I feel that our principals investigate thoroughly. Um, I feel that we can always do a better job at anything that we do. Um, something that I, when think in thinking of this question earlier, something I would like to do is I would like to make sure that there's annual training of the investigation process the documenting and the interviewing. And I would like to make sure that that is consistent across the schools um, and every administrator is doing it in the same way or their administrative team. Um, I would also like to make sure that we are ed each year educating our students in bullying. Um, currently, I think we have the OASIS that we program that we use. I would like to relook at it and make sure that it doesn't need to maybe be changed and us use a different one or just update. I don't know that everyone has the materials from that. It's been in place for many years. Mm -hmm. So those are some things to do. But I think the annual training, making sure that our investigation process is right on target would help a lot. Okay, Ms. Hale, your third question was number 20. Number 20. Mm -hmm. um, how important should career and technical education be in our school district, and what impact should CTE have on graduation readiness in our district? Well, first of all, it's a very important. Um, and I'm proud to say that it is an integral part of our system. Um, we have very strong, a very strong CTE um, classes and teachers. Um, it's dominant in our in grades 6 through 12. Uh, students develop skills in career and technical classrooms that help them to maybe decide their career path. Um, but they also use the skills that they've learned in the classroom and they become hands-on. It is very important that we, we support those CTE teachers and that the CTE teachers also work with the classroom teachers because it's making a difference. And our kids who graduate high school with, with um, industry certifications, you know, that's a, that's a direct line to the workforce. Uh, culinary, your surf save, that's, they're ready. They have that industry certification and they know what to do in that, those particular jobs. Um, we have um, the OSHA 10 certifications that our high school students are getting as well that has to do with safety on the job. Ag department, um, construction, automotive, they're all doing that. Also, if you have your industry certification and two EPSOs, that's a ready, ready graduate qualification too. Thank you. Okay, my third question is number 22. 
explain your experience with and knowledge of RTI squared initiatives and provide your opinion as to how well they work in our district. I'm going to start backwards because I think they work well. Um, I think that that it, that we must do it with fidelity, but I feel that the small groups are what that's what we need. That's what our students need. They need to work in small groups at the level they're in and move forward. That's how we grow them. That's how they're going to show achievement. Um, I also feel that RTI is is a wonderful program because response to intervention. You've not only got students that maybe have deficits that you're working with, but your tier ones are getting enrichment. You're building on skills that they get in the classroom. You sh they should be taking those skills further during that time. Um, I have experienced RTI from elementary all the way through high school, and I will tell you with an at-risk population, RTI was critical. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brock. Um, this will kind of go to your follow-up and to the response you gave as far as our uh, most important priority or issue that you, you would face at the very beginning. You mentioned uh, recruiting and retaining. Yes. Um, just what strategies do you think will work to get not just educators, teachers, but also of all of our support staff positions. How are we going to get them, but how are we going to keep them? Well, I feel that hosting county job fairs would be a great avenue. They need to come and, and, and see what, what jobs we have, not just on the website, but a place where they could come. I mean, we had a career fair the other day in every department. This was for the high school. But every department was almost, almost every department was represented. And so students, juniors, could see what departments are in the education system. Maybe they want to go that way. I don't know. But I think that would help our community. Um, the second part of your question was how would, I main, how would I keep them? I think that our district's doing a good job at the present, and I think the first thing we have to look at is our pay scale. And I think the way, the way that we're working to see what we're going to do with that in the future will help. Mr. King, number 24. You kind of already answered this a little bit, but it'll give you a chance to expand some. What importance do you place on having a student-centered approach to learning? I feel that's probably the most one of the most important types of learning. That's the most important type of approach. Um, and it begins with our educators and our staff. Um, I feel that we have to allow our students to share in decision making. Um, we have to believe in them. Believe in them. Meet, meet them where they are and believe in them. Um, and I think we have to remember what it's like to learn. Hmm. Put ourselves back in their shoes. What, what was it like to be in a third grade classroom that maybe I'm a little behind in and everybody else is is moving right along. How do I feel? And then I think at that point, that's when we look at individual needs. Um, so in my mind, student-centered approach is the best way. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Hamby, uh, your third question is number 26. Ms. Hamby, may I add to my last question, my, my last answer? Do you mind? Sure. Is okay. that okay? One of the other things, with that is we have to maybe meet their social emotional needs children are different not by any fault of their own our society is different we, we take care of those needs whether that's a new pair of shoes or just a hug in the morning to say you've got this then the next the other will come uh, Ms. Hamby? Will you require district staff to respect members of the board with the questions they may have and request for information? Absolutely. Once again, open communication. Um, we, I, would, I would want anybody to listen, to answer, to assist in getting any information you need. 
or want as long as it's, you know, allowable. But absolutely, once again, we're a team. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Ms. Boston, your third question is number 29. How do you approach difficult decisions? Look at all the facts, <laughs> everything that I need, and then I look at where it falls with policy and procedure, and I make a decision. And I tell myself and anybody else, this is not personal, this is professional. Nobody likes to make difficult decisions, but it's part of it. It's part of it. It is. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Safty, your fourth question, number six. Thank you. <clears throat> In what ways should a director of schools make a board of education more effective? Hmm. The director of schools has to be uh, on new educational initiatives. Once I gain the knowledge, it's my responsibility to share that with you as a board. Because if you don't know, you can't make the best decision that you should make to help our schools be successful. So that's, and the other is just to make sure that, that I'm open, our communication lines are open with each other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Shirley passed on question on this question. Um, so, Ms. Hale, we're on question number four, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm starting to lose my place. <laughs> uh, Ms. Hale, your number four uh, question was number 17. Number 17? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, yes, I remember this question. How visible should a director of schools be in our schools and the community? Very visible. Um, I understand. Please don't. Director of schools, everyone is so busy. There are lots of different things that we have to do in a day. But if I'm if if I was the principal, I wasn't sitting at my desk all day. I wasn't effective that way. I didn't know what was going on in my building. And I would be that I would feel that way as a director of schools too. I try to be in the buildings now. I'm not out as much as I want. It would need to be a priority, and I need to, I need to, even in the role I'm in right now, make it more of a priority, because they, teachers, students, all employees need to see us. And at that point, if we're visible, we're more approachable. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that we have to be that way in the community, too. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, my fourth question was number 14. Uh, what experience do you have in dealing with federal programs or ESSER funds? Well, with federal programs, um, I was, I've was i worked in the federal programs programs <laughs> with 21st Century. Uh, I've worked in two Title I schools The with federal programs at Phoenix. I, Phoenix was the only high school in the county that's a Title I school, so I had to do <coughs> budgeting and I had to decide how I could blend and braid and make all of the pieces fit to where I met the needs of the students. Also, uh, with federal programs at Phoenix with the District Priority School Improvement Grant, I was able to work with the state um, as well as our directors of federal programs um, as a turn for a turnaround school, and that was a very big learning experience, um, I have to say. And as far as ESSER goes, as at Phoenix, um, ESSER 2.0 came out right before they were gathering information before I took this position. So the staff at Phoenix, we all divided up. They had different uh, pieces of a survey that was given and their input was gathered and sent on up to the district level to help give input as to what they thought as educators that at, we needed. And then for ESSER 3.0, I was involved in stakeholder meetings, um, just anything that needed to be done, I helped with that as well. Surveys. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Right. Mr. Brock, do you remember 
I, I, personally, I think that's where I strayed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I was looking for your number four. Apologies. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the one where you uh, uh, you ad libbed. Uh, I've got it. That, that okay. was it. Uh, it was yes. about funding. Yes. I'm uh, the director of schools advocate for more funding for employees. Yeah. Place. Thank you. Uh, so much of what schools are able to do, and what we are able to do as a board and you would be able to do as a director of schools is based on funding, both at the state level and at the local level from county commissioners, local government. What would you do, what could you do in order to loosen those funds and convince those two groups that we need and our need is justified for funding. Once again, open communication with those groups. Um, I would have to kind of like the initiative uh, educating you all on, on educational initiatives, would have to educate different groups of the needs, why those needs are there, and how the funds would help that, those needs. So I just think making sure that everybody's educated, every, the open communication, and that they are part, there's, they have a stake in this as well, especially the community. I mean, the, the county commission, this is our community we're talking about. This is the future of Cumberland County. So I just think, once again, keeping those lines of communication open. How are we going to do that? How, how? Are we gonna, how are we going to communicate with local government? Yes, I'm going to go to meetings. I'll be involved. I would be involved with them. I would ask for them to come and, and hold meetings of my own. Um, that's that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, Mr. King, number nine. <clears throat> kind of goes into some things you've already said, but describe what you intend to be your communication style with district parents, and how important those communications will be to you as the director of schools. I've always wanted to be approachable. As a classroom teacher, I wanted to be approachable to parents, to students, to everyone. As a principal, I wanted to be approachable. And I would want to be approachable as a director of schools. I want to be visible. Um, I would definitely, I think, I, office hours for them possibly as well would not be a bad thing. Informal meetings, we might have informal meetings. Might, maybe a parent advisory team just like we have the employee advisory. Um, those are some different ways that I would definitely work with the parents. I want to be innovative. Um, I have some ideas uh, that I think, I think I have to meet them where they are. And if that means I'm meeting them through technology, then I'll meet them through technology. If that means I meet them in person in little town meetings, then I'll meet them in person. I'll do what I have to do. They're as much a part of our school system as our teachers, our staff, and our students. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is that the one that I added to and that was would have been my fourth question? Well, I can't find your number four question, I think so that's that the must one have been that you ad-lib to. Too. <laughs> and she already answered it, so I don't have a fourth one. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, Ms. Boston, your fourth question is number 28. How open will you be to discussing matters of concern with individual board members? As open as I would anyone else. You have a stake in this. I have a stake in this. My door's open. We'll discuss it. We'll get down to the nitty gritty and we'll come up with a solution. <laughs> okay, does anyone else have any other further questions? We didn't, I don't think we had any for the last applicant. Uh, so uh, now, uh, if you would like, you can have five minutes for a closing statement. Uh, tell us anything you want us to, to know above and beyond what we've already discussed. Or you can rehash, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I just want you to know that no matter what comes of these interviews, Stephanie Barnes 
loves Cumberland County. I love Cumberland County kids. I love the school system. I love the staff. I'm going to be here and continue doing what I do that I've done for 27 years. I appreciate you for giving me this opportunity to listen to my answers. Um, I will tell you that if I am chosen as the director of schools, I will do my very best, but I am human. I will make mistakes, but I will correct them. Um, I will not have all the answers, but I will search for them. And I am a team player. That's what I have, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And once again, thank you to all of our uh, administrators and all of our uh, Miss Sue York. Thank you for being here from the County Commission. <laughs> I want um, all of your tails for four more years. So, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Brown, I'm not going to do it and that's how we loosen the purse strings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. But uh, thank you for being here, everybody. We really appreciate it. And we will we will take up again tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. You did a great job.